Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the inaugural Inconvenient Questions Special, brought to you by Strategic Moves, in collaboration with the National University of Singapore and the National University of Singapore Society. This evening, we have with us an illustrious panel that will give its take on the topic, Post-COVID, Leadership Beyond Management. This will be a two-hour session. Registered participants may wish to post their comments or questions through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Your question or comment will be raised by the moderator if there's the opportunity. You may wish to upvote any questions you deem interesting during the discussion. For those of you watching this live stream on YouTube, we apologize that you will not be able to participate in the discussion. It is now my pleasure to introduce the moderator for this evening, Mr. Vishwa Sadashivan, Editor-in-Chief of IQ, CEO of Strategic Moves, and former nominated Member of Parliament. Mr. Vishwa, please. Well, thank you. Thank you, Karina. <clears throat> I'm told that we've got um, uh, about a thousand people who have registered. That's very heartening. And without further ado, please let me introduce our panelists. Uh, he's been group CEO of DBS Bank since 2009. And under his charge, DBS uh, has grown in size, in profitability, and in reputation at a global level. DBS won the coveted World's Best Bank Award in 2020, this year, you know, uh, and it's given by the, the, the New York based global finance publication. This is not the first time that DBS won this award. In 2018, it won the same award, World's Best Bank Award. And um, DBS is also the largest bank by asset size in Southeast Asia. Please welcome our first panelist, Piyush Gupta. Hi, Piyush. Hello, Vishwa. Good to Hi. be on the show. Thank you. Our second panelist is one of the most respected figures in the public sector, in public service in Singapore. He was Singapore's head of civil service uh, from 1999 to 2005. He also served as the permanent secretary in various ministries, including the Ministry of Defense, the Ministry of Education, the Ministry of Finance, and of course, the Prime Minister's office. Uh, he was subsequently chairman of the Economic Development Board, and then after that, the group president of the Government Investment Corporation of Singapore from 2007 to 2016. <clears throat> he is a professor with the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. Please welcome Mr. Lim Chiang Guan. Hi, Visa. Hi, Mr. Lim. Good seeing you. <laughs> Good seeing you. She's um, received a bachelor's. She received a bachelor's degree in, in electrical engineering and economics from MIT. She was with McKinsey and Company from 2000 to 2012, as a, first as a consultant and subsequently, very soon after, in fact, as global partner. She joined the Ping An Group in 2012. The Ping An Group is a Chinese conglomerate that deals with insurance, banking, and financial services. It's China's biggest insurer with assets of over $1 trillion. Ping An is currently ranked 21 on Fortune's Global 500 list. Our panelist is co-CEO of the Ping An Group. She's a Singaporean based in China. She's actually calling in from China. She's ranked 22nd on the Forbes World's 100 Most Powerful Women list. Please welcome Jessica Tan. Hi, everyone. Hi, hi, Jessica. Good to join you. Our fourth panelist is, you could call him a leadership guru. As a president scholar in Singapore, uh, he chose not to take the usual path of joining the administrative service, like Mr. Lim Siong Guan did. He was with McKinsey and company for most of his career. For 30 years, he served as managing director with McKinsey and Company from 1980 to 2010. He founded McKinsey's leadership practice, and today he's chairman of the Linhart Group. And in this capacity, he counsels CEOs all over the world. He's practice professor with the National University of Singapore's Business School, as well as the School of Public Policy. Please welcome Sia Sun Yen. 
Hi, everyone. Hi, Sun Yen. How are you? Okay, so we've got a full slate here. Good. Um, so a quick introduction of our format. What we, what we plan to do is we have, each time we have a special discussion, we'll have one person, one of the panelists, uh, to do a major presentation, his or her thesis on the subject. Uh, this time I've requested uh, Piyush to do us the honors. So Piyush, you've got 10 minutes to tell us what your take is on leadership. And the topic is uh, leadership beyond management. Over to you. All right, thank you, Mishra. Um, I, this is a very um, uh, uh, high power panel. So I guess folks over here know a lot more about leadership uh, than I do, but let me uh, give you my take on uh, some insight. First, I think the essence of what leadership about is about is actually quite immutable. And you got to set up a purpose or mission. You go, you're responsible for trying to create a strategy. You need to create a people system, a business system. Uh, you got to uh, principally uh, try to create a culture uh, that is a viable, workable culture. So I don't think uh, any of these are earth shattering uh, insights. Most leaders wind up having to do a mix of all of these things. Uh, however, I think how the leadership expresses itself and how you actually go about the task of leadership uh, often changes. And it changes with circumstance, it changes with time, and it changes with the priority of a company or a nation at any point in time. So uh, to tee up today's discussion, I'm going to uh, suggest three important changes that are happening right now. Uh, and I'm going to talk to the changes that are happening from a corporate perspective but perhaps try and tease out some parallels to what it means for leadership at any level, national, state, et cetera, if you will. Uh, so the first of these is uh, in the corporate world, there's no question that, uh, but in the last couple of years, there has been a really important and profound shift uh, and emphasis on the idea of purpose or intent. Uh, the idea that you need to be a leader who has clarity about what is the impact you're making on community and society uh, not just on the PNL of the company, has started gaining a lot of currency. Uh, the shorthand for this is a shift from just shareholder value, uh, espoused by Milton Friedman, uh, to a broader uh, uh, a prism of stakeholder value, uh, multiple stakeholders uh, in society. Some people also call it uh, a question of debate between value and values. Uh, value being a pure PNL focus, uh, generating shareholder return values being a broader emphasis on a broader set of things that you uh, potentially uh, need to achieve. Um, now, as, as you know, the Business Leaders Roundtable in the US made some big pronouncements on this uh, last year, suggesting that the role of a company is to be a lot more than just focus on shareholder return. I think the parallels for uh, leadership at a national and state level are uh, actually quite uh, apparent. Uh, if you look back to the 1980s, one of the outcomes of the Thatcher-Reagan era uh, was a huge emphasis on uh, capitalism and a market-oriented uh, economy. Uh, by and large, most countries in the world shifted to trying to run leadership, uh, letting the markets determine a lot of things. Uh, in that, uh, 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 one of the outcomes of that is the role of government and the role of leaders and the role of uh, uh, leadership at the top started morphing and changing a bit. In many countries around the world, the idea that leadership meant effectively trying to run the country like an incorporated entity, um, you know, Japan Inc. Uh, or Hong Kong Inc. or Singapore Inc. that started gaining currency. Uh, but if you go back to the idea of the social contract to, you know, uh, uh, people like Rousseau and Locke and so on in the 18th century, the notion of citizens giving up something to a controlling entity, a leadership and a government in exchange for something was actually uh, uh, fairly well understood and defined. And uh, I think today, the parallel from the corporate world to a national uh, leadership level is therefore uh, uh, something that you can actually see or uh, put your mind to. What should leadership at a national level be? Do you need to really think of beyond the PNL? Do you need to think of beyond a technocratic short-term outcomes? Should we thinking of a social contract which is a different kind of social contract? Uh, is the role of government to set up uh, opportunity for people, a uh, level playing field, an equal platform? And if so, how much more activist should the government be and how much more activist should leadership be uh, in that kind of regard? So I think that's the first thing which I'd like to throw out, that there is a shift, there's a change in circumstance. 
society is evolving inequity is the big issue of our times inequality is the big issue of our times and leadership needs to be able to think through some of these issues so you're not actually uh, overly narrowly defined with what your agenda needs to be the second idea i want to throw up is uh, again in the corporate world there is a big shift from what i call vertical leadership to what uh, increasingly today is being thought of as horizontal leadership if you think about leadership in a corporate world you know much of this uh, traces back to max weber and his creation of the bureaucracy in again the the uh, late 19th century it sort of mirrored henry ford assembly line and that uh, created the archetype of leadership it is a command and control structure you control through layers of middle management to bottom management information flowed from top to bottom uh, you set direction at the top and you executed at the bottom well this is the second form of a change in the expression of leadership today a party because of the change in the nature of people a party due to the change in the nature of technology uh, is beginning to be quite clear that uh, the command and control style of leadership the top down leadership uh, is not necessarily as effective as it used to be frankly today talent can be found anywhere in the organization there is no premium on knowledge the youngest kid in the company probably knows more than people who have been around for 20 30 years how do you tap into the idea and the energy of large numbers of people in a horizontal way how do you lead in a way which is collaborative and participative instead of necessarily top down uh, this is one of the big challenges that leaders are seeing today the companies which are doing well have been able to create an uh, environment and a culture which is agile which is nimble which allows people to participate in this process now you can see where i'm going with this the the teasing of this into the national or state leadership is equally uh, uh, obvious uh, there is a time in the history of nations when you need to lead from the front you need to set direction you need to lead from the top uh, you set up a direction policy framework people follow however countries also evolve and uh, i would argue in singapore's case for example we have evolved a lot in the last 50 years the quality of our private sector the quality of our civil society the quality of our different kinds of participants in the country has changed materially in the period of time so it is possible to really see whether uh, how you try and take this notion of horizontal leadership uh, at a country level i often talk to people in the system saying you know we need to see how it, is singapore does singapore need to evolve more from a whole of government to a whole of nation and if it's a whole of nation how do you create a more participative form of engagement and leadership actually frankly we've been doing a lot more in recent years uh, the emerging stronger task force that i'm on is a great example of this we're getting the private sector to lead a lot of exercises uh, in partnership with the public sector so it's coming along but again the question is uh, do we need to do more of it the third idea i want to tee up and leave uh, is leadership in the past was mostly about experience a lot of it was instinct um, uh, uh, and gut instinct at that uh, one of the big changes that's happening today is uh, the role of data uh, data is getting to be so powerful that to be insight driven you need to, by and large to be data driven uh, the volume variety and veracity of data is so enormous it captures patterns it recognizes things that your eyes don't recognize and your brain doesn't uh, recognize but the data recognizes it and therefore uh, really thoughtful leadership knows how to leverage and use data in a far more meaningful way than our predecessors ever had to uh, again i think the parallels at a national level are quite apparent uh, how do you actually create data transparency how do you create a wealth of data that informs judgments and informs choices uh, how do you make sure that the pluses and minuses of using the appropriate kind of data are factored into the process uh you know what is appropriate data to use and what is not an appropriate data to use some of these are really important because it can guide the thinking around what kind of leadership you want and and, and where you want to take the system uh i'm going to wind up with just one thought uh, and uh, as we discussed in a previous session i did with you vishwa yeah what yeah. to me one of the important things with all of these three uh, uh, ideas i've laid out is that um they require a lot more judgment they require a lot more subtlety they require a lot more human instinct so the leader of today cannot afford to be purely technocratic the leader of today to my mind needs to be able to connect the dots uh, in a very nuanced way and therefore in my last session i told you i think people underestimate the value of humanities underestimate the role of philosophy underestimate the role of uh, psychology ethnography in making sure that we understand how to be able to put these dots together 
I think the big questions of our age are going to be questions like, what makes us human beings? Why are we different from machines? Uh, what should robots be allowed to do? Uh, what level of privacy is okay and what, what is not okay? These kinds of questions are questions of ethics, of morality, and questions of the soft sciences more than just technocratic questions. And therefore, my belief is that leadership as we go forward has got to be able to embrace this in a very different kind of form. Uh, so maybe I'll stop there and uh, pass it back to you. Well, thank you very much, Pirish. Um, that was, uh, that you packed a lot in that, in that duration. Thank you. Thank you for also sticking to the time. Uh, it's, it's quite interesting that you brought up the last point, right, about the importance, let's not you know, underestimate or undervalue the importance of humanities uh, as a component of leadership, you know, to understand humanities uh, to be a leader as well. We're not, we're not <clears throat> saying that STEM subjects are not important. We are saying that, you know, we need to give equal importance to humanities, you know, and, and it's interesting that, that, you know, in the, in the past few weeks, there have been, there have been this, this, con this, this, this discussion uh, about interdisciplinary education in Singapore, you know, led by National University of Singapore, NUS. You know, it started with uh, with an article or a letter, you know, to uh, uh, to the forum, uh, to the Straits Times by NUS President Tan Ing Chai, where he talked about the importance of interdisciplinary thinking and moving from just multidisciplinary to interdisciplinary thinking. I, I think that's really what you are also alluding to. We need people who can synthesize different ideas, you know. And I also like the point you made earlier on about, you know, when you talked about purpose and intent, uh, you know, taking center stage in, in a leader's mind, in a leader's uh, decision frame, uh, you talked about the importance of shifting uh, from value to values. You know, I think that's an interesting point. The uh, question is, who determines the values of the organization, of the country, and so on? You know, um, and the second point you made was shift from vertical to horizontal thinking. And, um, and you talked about the importance of collaborative sort of uh, governance from, uh, from whole of government to whole of nation. You, these are some of the interesting buzzwords that you used. One of the questions that, that comes up is, you know, how difficult true collaboration is. You know, uh, is collaboration uh, just an activity uh, and you just tick the boxes, or is collaboration an attitude? You know, the problem with collaboration is if you just tick the boxes because it's 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 um, interesting, it's it's kosher, but you don't really mean it. You actually erode public trust because it comes across as hypocrisy, right? The the third point you raised, uh, the third chain, changes the role of data, and it's it's such an important point, you know, but it crisscrosses other concerns as well. Number one, there are issues of privacy, right? I mean, and, and it's not going to go away. It's just going to get deepened, you know? So the issues of Facebook, the issues that Facebook is facing and others are facing is about privacy. It's also about, even as we are seeing the globalization and the liberalization and the democratization of values, of, of data, we are also seeing the, a lot of falsehoods and the, the, the need to discern the right from the wrong to need to discern the importance of ethics and the importance of real democratization of, of data, which translates to power. You know, I, I hope that we'll be able to talk about some of these things in fairly concrete terms pertaining to your own organization, your experience. And I think it's important for us as we, in the next two hours, for us to illustrate some of the points that we're talking about uh, through our own experiences. And with that, uh, it gives me great pleasure to go to uh, Mr. Lim Xiong Guan. You've got five minutes. Yeah, well, um, Rizwa, it just seems to me that Piyush has given such a comprehensive uh, <laughs> uh, treatment of the subject, you wonder what else there is to add. Um, I want to say that somebody just, uh, uh, someone just challenged me, you know, uh, to say that, uh, you know, when you talk about leadership, uh, it encompasses such a, a variety of, um, uh, of uh, not just skills and knowledge, a variety in terms of values and attitudes and so forth. Uh, and so he challenged me to say, can I summarize everything about leadership within 10 words? Uh, which really is, uh, was to me a wonderful challenge. So uh, I dreamt over it um, and, uh, and by the next morning I got an answer and I, and I did it in six words. Uh, and I just summarized it in terms of um, think people, think future, think excellent. I, I, I think a leader has to be able to uh, address all three. 
the first one about thinking people, uh, and I think Piyush has covered uh, wonderfully about this subject. Uh, you have to think about the people that you have to serve, and particularly when you talk about government and the public sector, uh, you're talking about the general public. You're talking about connecting with the whole of society. You have to think of those people. In addition to, like Piyush had mentioned, about the young people coming in, they probably have more knowledge and more skills than any of the older people in senior uh, executive positions. Uh, you have to think of your own people uh, about motivation, about uh, uh, giving them a sense of purpose running the organization. Um, I also felt I wanted to comment about this thing about um, uh, you know, interdisciplinary thinking and about multidisciplinary. Uh, you know, one can easily fall into a temptation to think that, uh, well, you know, since we have to take into account so many different factors, let's just pump more knowledge into the students in university. So instead of just STEM um, bits of knowledge and information, let's pump in some more um, uh, knowledge and information about philosophy, uh, whereas we really have to come around to say, what's the state of our spirits, what's the state of our, uh, of our hearts, what's our basic attitude towards people. The second one about think future seems to me that this is a most basic challenge which, uh, uh, which, uh, which leaders have, uh, and which is particularly something which only the leaders can do. They have a particular responsibility for it. It cannot be contracted out. Uh, and when we talk about government, and government in particular has to think long term for the country. Uh, but, um, but importantly, a lot of the time, uh, the public, the general, uh, uh, the, the lay person outside uh, won't know what the government is actually doing with respect to preparing for the future. Um, uh, but uh, if the, when the future comes along and the government is found wanting, you know the government hasn't been up to its job and hasn't been doing its job properly. But along the way, a lot of people have very little idea as to whether the government is doing or is not doing whatever is necessary uh, to position the country for the future. Um, and particularly COVID-19 has brought us into a situation where it's easy to think in terms of dealing with the known knowns, you know, all the things from the past, all the, uh, all the bits of information, all the procedures that you have worked up from the past, and, you know, you just apply it to a situation. Uh, but we know that we have to confront a situation of the known unknowns. Uh, for example, the China-US uh, relationship, where will it go? You know, will they cooperate? Will they fight it out with each other? What exactly is going to happen? We don't know, but we can posit uh, that there'll be this variety of scenarios to, and, and, and we have scenario planning to deal with it. Uh, but the most important thing COVID has brought to our attention is leaders need to deal with situations of the unknown unknowns. This is a situation of the black swan. Now, this you would say is, is, quite, a, uh, is quite a big challenge. Uh, if you don't know what you don't know, and yet you have to deal with a future which suddenly springs on you. Uh, it's almost like saying leaders have to be able to uh, expect the unexpected and know how to deal with it. Well, how do we deal with it? I think this is uh, one of the basic challenges of, of leadership, uh, which COVID-19 has brought to the fore to people. Even though people five years ago might have said that pandemics is going to be a severe challenge for humanity or for the world, uh, but if you don't know the particular nature of the pandemic, you don't know exactly what to do anyway. Uh, so uh, it's more a call about values, it's a call about attitudes and behaviours and everything else in that domain which we feel have brought up. Of course, the final point is about think excellent and excellence is really uh, running your organisation and bringing your people in such a way that, that um, uh, each person is doing the best he or she can. Uh, each person becomes the best he or she can be according to his or her uh, potential. Uh, and finally, how do you run uh, an institution? How do you run a whole of government? Or like uh, P.U. says, a whole of nation uh, in such a way that the nation is the best it can possibly be. I mean, this from a conceptual or philosophical point of view, but, uh, but it does demand some rather um, clear action uh, to, to help bring about such a situation. So that's my point. Uh, just six words. Actually, it's only four words done in three phases. Think people, think future, think excellence. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lim. Uh, and uh, it's interesting that you, you talked about think excellence as well. You know, I mean, giving everybody a chance, creating an environment that, that allows for each individual the chance to make an impact and, and, and feel that he or she is making an impact. It's not always the same thing. Right. And, and Piyush, I remember it, when, when we did my, our interview on IQ, you talked about, you talked about create, allowing each individual in DBS the opportunity to make an impact. You know, I, I, think, I think that's such an, such an important and interesting point, you know, 
uh, it, it's not just about the activity, it's also about the individual feeling that he or she has been given the opportunity to, to, to make that impact. Uh, the other interesting point, the other point, Mr. Lim, that you brought up, you know, that, that get, get, got me thinking is that the leader today, you know, has to deal with a lot more unknown unknowns. And that means the leader today has to be a lot more comfortable with uncertainty. You know, we have been very good in producing leaders who make decisions based on a whole lot of data that is presented to them. So they have the luxury to say, you know, I want to wait until I have the full data before I make a decision, you know, and, and that's a luxury these days. Leaders have to use a lot more deductive reasoning, join the dots and be comfortable making decisions in the dark, so to speak. So I, I hope that we'll be able to talk about how do we inculcate this ability in people? You know, uh, it's, it's easier said than done, but, but how do we do that? When we are live, we have been we have been brought up all this while to really um, focus on predictability, and that's beyond our control. Uh, and I think that's a that's a good 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 way to segue into you, Jessica. You strike me as a person who who enjoys dealing with the unpredictable. You enjoy the challenge of of just going out there and trying something new. I mean, just I mean, from what I gather, you you are a mother, right? Yes, of course. And, and, yeah. and, and uh, uh, one, two children? How many children do you have? Uh, two daughters. And how old are they? Uh, 10 and 14. 10 and 14. And you are working in China. So how, how, do, you, how do you manage that? Uh, well, before the COVID, I used, I used to travel every week. Back, every so. week? Yes. To spend time with them over the weekend and then you fly back? Yep. And during the COVID? During the COVID, now I do every two months. Oh, no. You see, and, and it, it's not any not anyone can handle, handle this sort of a stress, you know, because, you know, a mother would feel, that, would feel guilty, would have all these other emotions that can come and distract you from having to do your job. I hope you'll be able to share with us how you manage this and, and maybe a little, bit, a little bit about the importance of having gender equality, gender representation uh, in key positions in future driven organizations. Over to you, Jessica. Sure. Um, so maybe what, that, what I'll do is first is um, uh, I'll talk a little bit about leadership. And then I think as a, as a woman, um, I, I don't think it's any particularly different. I've been traveling every week for 20 years, uh, ever since my McKinsey life. Um, and I think, uh, you know, and you, you are able to draw lines on what you can manage. Uh, so, yeah. So I think that on that front, uh, I'm actually very happy. And my daughters are here and, and they know when they come to China, they know what I'm doing and they were excited what I'm doing. I think um, I want to give a little bit more personal spin because I think um, Piyush and uh, Mr. Lim uh, uh, gives very good um, summary of what leadership is. I wanted to give a little bit of spin on, you know, leadership in a very large organization, right? In a country like China, where I spent the last past eight years on. Uh, I think- sorry, because sorry. As how, many, how, how many staff do you have? I've been here eight years. How many staff do you have? In Ping uh, I, I manage about 10 companies, about 50,000 um, uh, 50, staff. Okay, thank yeah. you. No problem. Uh, so, um, it, and it strikes me because uh, my first part of my career, um, I was 13 years in McKinsey uh, and as partner, you know, I'm used to very, the first part of um, being successful leader, right? uh, which is intellectually uh, being able to solve problems, understanding what is important, uh, be it by value or values, uh, as Pierce said, um, and you know, intrinsically break down that you know, to an aspiration and vision. I think one of the things that I learned that is not sufficient as a very inspirational leader. Uh, one of the things that I learned and, and why I really enjoy working here uh, with our founder, um, Peter Mar, is that, you know, as a real entrepreneur, he built this company from scratch, from 13 people to 1.4 million people that we have here, uh, you know, in 32 years, you know, an entrepreneur sees opportunities. You know, as a consultant, I used to see problems all the time. You know, Sun Yen, who professed, he's a veteran more than I am. You know, we are trained to see problems and problems and we solve problems. Um, but, you know, uh, for a true entrepreneur, and I think this is one of the things that I really enjoy learning the past eight years. And as a leader of a good, big and growing organization, you have to see opportunities. And you see lots of opportunities. The more problems there are, the more opportunities there are. And that really drive and excel you. And I think that's one very important factor that I see missing in a lot of people. 
the second factor, I think, you know, when you run very large organization, um, you know, I was, I, I joined Ping An first as the CEO of one of our companies We have you know, 32 companies and then two, three companies. And then eventually now, um, you know, I have about 11 companies under myself. Uh, you know, you have to learn also uh, working, you know, as, you know, uh, Mr. Lim and Piyush both said, you no, know, very different people. And how to inculcate the culture, you know, whereby it's a can-do attitude. Uh, you know, not that, you know, when you say it's such an inspirational thing, but everybody keeps telling you, oh, oh but this cannot be done, etc. The hunger uh, that you can see in people, and that's what I enjoy working here, uh, is that, you know, there people are very driven. Uh, I remember when I used a very simple example, um, you know, um, you know, I, when I first came, we, you know, there was not very good facial recognition models for Chinese faces. This was back eight years ago. Now, of course, now everybody has it, you know, and, you know, when I wanted to do it within one week, we could do it because my scientists tell me that, you know, you need about, um, you know, a thousand people's kind of 3D models and stuff. You know, within a week, we bought 200 cameras, put it at the, you know, floor of our uh, um, uh, kind of uh, building. And then we have people, all employees, since I have, you know, 3,000 employees at that time, people just volunteer and sat there. You know, within a week we had uh, what, we want, uh, you know, what we wanted to do. You know, these type of individual examples, I can name a gazillion uh, in my course of eight years here. You know, to be able to do it, you have to, you know, inculcate a culture whereby people are driven, uh, you know, they soft, it's like fighting a war, a battle, you know, you you basically accomplish one thing after another. You know, I'm at this point where, you know, nothing is impossible. You know, even if it's impossible, you know, you go try it uh, and, and do it. And I think that's a, that's a very important factor. Um, and then the third one uh, that I think is important is also, you know, the leader themselves. I think the other two is much more about, you know, really good uh, leadership. I think the third one is just a leader itself. What kind of leader? You, you mentioned, you know, whether it's gender difference or cultural difference. I'm, you know, I'm working in a foreign country. I've worked in, I think, about 15 different countries in my course of 20 years, uh, you know, in McKinsey and in North America, Europe, Asia, uh, and now the past eight years in China. I think it's about you as a person, a leader being very genuine, uh, a leader kind of showing, you know, there's no set rules of, you know, people have a lot of set rules about what it can or cannot do. I think as long as you're very clear, what is it? Um, you know, like for example, I fly back every weekend, of course, before the COVID. Everybody knows that, uh, including my 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 chairman, uh, my peers, my teams. Um, everybody knows. I don't I don't make that fuss, and you know, I try to be secretive about it. A lot of people try to hide, you know, what your own boundaries are, etc. And I think people get to know and accept who you are. Uh, and I think you can mix that uh, very easily, be it by culture, gender, or even as uh, Piyush was saying, different disciplines. All my work, because I looked after the transformation part of it, um, a lot of these 11 companies I have built from scratch over the past eight years. Uh, you know, when you build new companies or you create, you know, I drive a lot of transformation projects um, and that's what I get excited about. You have to be cross-discipline, you know, people who doesn't know lots of different disciplines, that's what Piyush was saying. And I think that that, that kind of culture being, you know, the leader, leader being genuine, um, I think is one of the important factors that help to gel people together. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, you know, the, the, the whole notion, the whole idea of creating, op spotting opportunities and creating opportunities. And I, I believe from those opportunities, you know, expanding and, and, and um, catering to the, to the hunger and the desire that people have as individuals, no matter where you are, what your station is, you know, to, to have the, the acceptance, I mean, to accept that every individual is entitled to have the desire to make an impact. I mean, I'm getting, I'm getting that sense, you know, and, but in order to do that, I guess the individual must be comfortable under his skin, right? I think that's what you're driving at. Uh, don't, don't be a chameleon. Uh, let people know who you are. Um, how important is it, if I may just ask you the question, how, how important is it that a leader is comfortable enough with his or her people to expose your vulnerability? So for me, I think it's very important. Um, because as I said, my 20 years, being McKinsey or Peng An, I have to work with very different people. I mean, in, in the consulting, you form projects, teams. So you are constantly working with different people, different cultures, different countries, you know, being in Vietnam, Thailand, et cetera. You can't always be the same as there, of course. You know. um, and so I, I found over the course of the years, it's much more important being transparent, genuine who you are. 
and people are understanding that. And we have flaws as well. Uh, they, they, you know, everyone knows that. But if you're much more open about um, your flaws, um, you know, you know, I will always say that. Um, as they know, they they know you don't mean it, and that you really mean that you, know, you want the best for both what the problem at hand is or the company is. And that for the individual, I think uh, I think that everyone accepts that across cultures. Yeah, Thank I really, you. I'll, I'll, I'll second that, Vishwa. I think yeah. you know people call it authentic leadership. I authentic think leadership. Hugely important. Yeah. Uh, the willingness to be yourself and for your team to know the true you, I think that goes a long, long way. Yeah. And that includes sharing a vulnerabilities. You know, everybody's yeah. got flat sides. Everybody's got flaws. And if you're willing to deal with it, then your people respect you a lot for it. Yeah, and, and I'd like to come back to that discussion a little later. Uh, it's a very, very important point, um, and, and there are many dimensions to that, to that equation. So I'll be coming to that in a while, but I'd like to go to Sun Yen. You know, uh, I, I recall in one of our, one of our conversations, Sun Yen, you, you talked a lot about the leader's ability to, uh, to feel for issues that are difficult like, like disparity, you know, like fairness. You know, you, you, I remember you saying that if the leader must feel uncomfortable, must feel perturbed, must stay awake at night when he feels that some of these things are not right. It's not just about getting the final, getting to the final line, but how we get there is as important. I, I recall that point that you made and, and quite passionately. Over to you. Well, let me just say, first of all, that I'm very proud of uh, all of you, uh, not just because I'm here, the most undeserving panelist, but uh, to me, uh, I follow and study and work with uh, leaders one at a time. And your uh, would number as uh, 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 the leaders uh, that I think Singapore should be very proud uh, to have. Um, let me sort of come at it uh, from a single leader, the human person point of view. And that may sound like a, off on a left field, but uh, I saw a lot of intersections with what Piyush, uh, Xiong Guan and, and uh, Jessica is saying. Um, I believe in times like this, the most important capacity for the leader to have is to be centered and fully present. Uh, let me explain what I mean. We came from a world where, where before COVID, uh, the, the buzzword is change is constant. Uh, with COVID added to the mix, the world order is uh, destabilized enough uh, and this, that uh, uncertainty could reign. I mean, which while you were talking about that, you know, we're, we're, we're in it now and with the uh, so, uh, geopolitical risks uh, coming at us in the next several months, uh, we could get in a state where uncertainty is constant. So imagine when we say post-COVID, you know, every consulting firm, accounting firms out there are talking about uh, post-COVID, um, we may not see things settle down to a new normal because new normal, we know how to deal with. Uh, it's change. A to B, B is different from A. Uh, but what if there is a new disorder uh, in which uh, 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 uncertainty uh, is constant and surprises prevail. Uh, the implications for uh, leadership, uh, and that's a topic for this evening, are uh, profound. Uh, first of all, as, as, as uh, 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 Xiong Guan has said, uncertainty is uh, when you don't know, and I might add, nobody knows. You know, I don't know how to speak French. I can go to somebody who knows or is familiar with it, but uncertainty is when you don't know, nobody knows. We cannot anticipate everything that we, 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 we are taught to anticipate uh, in business uh, with, uh, with COVID. So being centered in uncertainty uh, is really paramount. Now, what, what do I mean by that? Let me unpack it very, very quickly in the time that we have. First of all, is to be fully present for whatever comes at you, fully present. By presence, I mean, I don't mean appearance, uh, the way you dress, charisma, or even posture. Presence is more about the whole person being there, not just your intellect or skills, but also your emotions and spirit. That might sound like uh, some theory, but just look around you in a restaurant, 
how many people are there but they're distracted by cell phones and looking past each other? Uh, that's what the not present means, means to you. Uh, the biggest threat and opportunity always starts with very weak signals. I mean, uh, uh, Piyush talking about data, I'm not looking at it from an individual point of view. The good news is that there's the deluge of data. The bad news is that uh, the, 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 the biggest threat and opportunity uh, comes in weak signals. And if you're not present, you won't be able to detect these weak signals and be able to lock onto them, magnify them for timely action. And many executives are just way too frenetic. Uh, you don't speak 10 seconds and they jump to, uh, jump to a judgment. And that in the past, that uh, reflex is highly priced. But I doubt that in today's uh, uncertain environment, that uh, is still uh, the case. Number two is drawing on, uh, drawing on our qualities. The human, I mean, this is Piyush talking about being human. Being human is all about qualities because the rest of it is knowledge and skills. Uh, the qualities uh, beyond knowledge and skills to influence for good outcomes, not just for yourself, but for people around you, the society, the nation, and, and so on. Uh, our inner being has qualities such as courage, confidence, co compassion, caring, and creativity. In a high challenge situation, the best positive outcome these days don't come just because you have the right analytic answer, uh, but comes when a leader is able to intuitively, uh, and this comes from mastery, uh, to combine personal qualities to bring out the better selves and better intents and, and, and instincts from those uh, around them uh, and, and in themselves. Now, this has to be guided by a central reference point. I mean, historically, uh, that central reference point has to do with tradition, religion, or family. But these days, it could also come from a set of principles that you adopt, that you adhere to, as, uh, even in the, under great pressure. Uh, you can look around you and you know, the people that get into trouble are people who are flexible in their principles and rigid in their knowledge and skills rather than the other way around, which is that you're inflexible about your principle and flexible and adaptive on everything else. So uh, with maybe one minute, I will just kind of introduce how to be, become more centered. Uh, leadership is all about uh, knowing, doing, and being. Uh, historically, companies, uh, rewarding people and even government, perhaps, I don't know, uh, for delivering results by their knowing and doing. That's what we're trained for, that's what we're paid for. But being is all about qualities. Uh, board and owners that these days I'm uh, involved with are increasingly looking for qualities because they want CEOs who can, who can help them deal with uncertainty. Sadly, many leaders are still unsure of what qualities they have and don't know how to draw on them uh, in a moment of, of crisis. It starts with an awareness of what qualities we have. Then like a, some kind of fuzzy logic that you mastered, we learn uh, to, uh, to sense what combination works the best. And this takes time and practice much like the way a, a violinist would want to become a uh, virtuoso. You can't meditate uh, uh, and uh, practice a little bit of yoga and perhaps pray in a time of need and hope that that works. They help, but uh, you need to be centered and present throughout the entire uncertainty, which can be a long time. The good news is that for most of us, uh, there is so much good human qualities waiting to be unearthed and deployed. I know that because I work, I have the privilege to work with business leaders uh, to uncover and use them wisely. You need faith that you have those qualities and work joyfully to embrace uh, them uh, in order to uh, rise to the challenges that uncertainty brings. And to me, from, from a personal point of view, to get to the sort of the, we have to be whole of nation. I think that is a very, very important very, very great and right focus for us uh, here and now in Singapore. Uh, to do that, 
uh, instead of, of, of reacting by reflex to all the things that are go, not going right or not according to what I knew in the past, individuals can do a lot for them, for the nation by starting with themselves and getting centered and present with what really is going on. Then we can uh, follow and work with each other, the society. And I think uh, some of our ministers have spoken with, we need to have societal principles we need to redefine what those are. That's great, but, but uh, let's talk about what yours and my principles are so that we can know how to adapt and be flexible in collaborating with ourselves, uh, if you will, uh, in, this, in this uncertain age. Thank you, thank you, Sun Yen. I absolutely love your point about being fully present. Uh, you know, I just want to share a particular um, experience I had, you know, I had some of, uh, there was an occasion where a member of parliament, you know, uh, actually was, was, was a minister, I won't mention names, but, you know, was walking and um, there were several people standing. And what I noticed was um, he was not looking at the person whose hand he was shaking. He was shaking the hand of person number one and looking at person number two. And then he went on to shake the hand of person number two and looking at person number three. And the thing that struck me is he's not here. He's physically here, but he's really not here. You know, and, and um, that was very disheartening. You know? So when you say, I mean, that was an illustration, a very literal illustration of what being, in the, being fully centered and being in the present is. But, but let, me, let me ask a question because I think this point about being fully present links with the idea of being authentic and, and, and being real. And therefore, you know, being comfortable with exposing your vulnerabilities. You know, if you don't do that, it means that you don't trust the people you work with. Fundamentally, that's what it boils down to, right? So let me ask all of you a fairly straightforward question. It's a very simple, straightforward question. Why is there this seeming reluctance to say, I'm sorry. It is not unnatural for things to go wrong, even with the best effort. And when you know that what you did has resulted in an outcome that was not desired and that it was wrong, why do I sense that there is such a huge reluctance in, for, in people in positions of leadership to acknowledge that we, I, had, I could have done better why? Uh, it seems to me, you know, there are two or three answers to that. Uh, the most obvious answer is face. So people have a sense of face and you feel you sort of diminish yourself if you acknowledge your errors. A second answer is, particularly if you're in the US, is litigation. The minute you say you're sorry, you leave yourself vulnerable to yeah. somebody coming and suing you for a, for a billion dollars. Uh, and so oftentimes people are worried about acknowledging mistakes uh, uh, and so on. And I think uh, to be fair and charitable, third is that in increasingly in today's social media world, uh, you know, acknowledging errors uh, gets you on the wrong side of a lot of people. People go to town um, and say, oh, you know, we told you this person, et cetera, et cetera. So I can understand why it's not natural for people to accept. However, I think the point we're all making is the same. I just don't think you can be a long-term good leader for your people if people don't trust you and don't see you for being a genuine person. And I start with the basic premise. I mean, none of us are perfect. So the notion that we can do our jobs and do our work without making a mistake, how can that be? Um, so I change my mind the whole time. When facts change, I change my mind. When somebody educates me, I change my mind. Oftentimes, the I is, you know, I screwed it up. So in the best thing is to go and tell people, sorry, I screwed it up. You know, can we start all over again? And, 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 um, of, course, and of course, to mean it when you say, I'm sorry. Not yes, because no. some PR consultant told you it's good to say, I'm sorry. Well, of course, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and people can tell when you mean it, when you say, I'm sorry. You know, Mr. Lim, yeah. you've been head of civil service. You've been a leader in the civil service for a long time. Please be honest and give okay. us your take on this. Um, I think a lot of the time people, uh, uh, we were the interpretation of this, you know, why, uh, why top leaders are unwilling to say that, uh, that they were wrong is uh, because of face or because... Uh, um, and because of this uh, sense of lack of confidence, I'm not terribly sure that that's the case at all. 
uh, I think in many instances, uh, you start off uh, with the sense of what is the value of taking that action? Okay. Now, if, uh, if, if you're running in a situation where people have um, intrinsic trust in you, they trust you. They trust that uh, you're all the time trying your best. They trust that uh, you're all the time having their, um, their well-being at heart. Um, and then in that kind of situation, you say, you know, I, I'm really sorry, you know, I, 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 um, I did it wrong this time. So, um, so uh, uh, like you says, you know, there's new information or there's new perspective in this. So, uh, so, so uh, we'll have to get onto a new track. But on the other hand, if you start with this idea that people don't have that, uh, you know, what people are looking out uh, is to be able to say that I told you this guy is just a bum. He doesn't know what he's doing. Then you say, what, what benefit, uh, uh, you know, what, what positive effect is there for doing this? There, or, there will be the minority of people who are just going to jump in and, and you're going to say, yes, okay, so I did it wrong this time. There's going to be the minority, normally it's just a minority of people who come along to sort of say, I told you, uh, I told you this guy doesn't know what he's doing and, and they go to town on social media on it. Uh, what the majority of the people uh, who are uh, prepared to go along with you, um, uh, in fact, they, they get diverted by, by all this um, talk of other people saying what, uh, what an idiot their boss has, uh, has been. Um, I'd rather suspect that a lot of the time we talk vulnerabilities, um, my own personal view, I think, is that we make too much of a point about it. Um, I mean, who, who wants to serve a boss whom we all know don't know what he's doing? Right. So if you say that's about uh, about being honest and authentic, I mean, that doesn't make sense at all. What people want uh, is a sense that uh, the guy in charge uh, has uh, has my well-being at heart and the guy in charge knows what knows what he's doing, uh, uh, for which, uh, you know, even though he doesn't have all the knowledge, at least he's asking the right questions. Uh, he's pursuing the right issues. That is what people want. So fundamentally, uh, especially I think when you're dealing with the government, uh, that's dealing with, uh, you know, you're dealing with with, uh, with the lives of millions of people uh, with whom you can't have that, that personal connection. Uh, I think the most important thing that a leader has to do is to, uh, is to establish this sense of uh, confidence, this sense that, um, that uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm really uh, concerned and I care about your well-being uh, and I seek all the time to do the very best that, that I can. Um, I think a good part of it also has to do with communication. Uh, in other words, uh, you know, whether, whether you communicate on the basis of, I thought about it and this is the perfect solution or the best solution I can think of at this time and this is why we are doing it. Or here, uh, you know, like we've talked about, are uh, you dealing with a situation where of great um, uncertainty, we don't know what tomorrow is going to turn, turn out to be like. So it's much better to formulate it not in terms of this is a problem we're trying to solve because you don't even know the extent of the problem. It's much better to say that this is what we're trying to address. We want to make sure that you remain healthy. We want to make sure that you are safe. And that is yeah. what we're trying to do. For but, which but, what we actually do yeah. will have to change along the way. Yeah, but of course, if, if every day you as a leader are coming out to say, I'm sorry, I screwed up, I'm sorry, I screwed up, then you've got no business being there. Right. Uh, when we talk about you know, being comfortable, being authentic, it is about the occasional time for you to say, I'm sorry, I, I didn't get this right. You know, it, but people, people I, I feel, you know, I, I don't know how the rest of you feel. I, I feel that people are actually a lot more forgiving and a lot more accepting than we give them credit for. You know, Singaporeans, we, we, we just say the netizens will, will chew you and spit. But I don't think so. Actually, the netizens, I've seen the netizens being a lot more, uh, a lot more forgiving than I imagine. But they expect increasingly the individual in leadership position to come out and be forthright and be honest about situations. It's not about saying, I don't know, I, I'm unworthy. But it's about saying, you know, every now and then, I, I'm hoping that I'll be educated on this matter a little bit more. Right. Oh, um, I agree with you. Please. Yeah, thank you. What, um, uh, Jessica, Sonian, any comments? Sure. Um, I, I, I think a personalized problem in the sense that I think um, is what a mental model of what a leader should be. I think, um, uh, at least I think of a leader as getting the direction correct. The leader should not be expected to take up. So, but the direction should be, so where do we want to go? What is it that you know, we want to end up with? 
I think that has to be right, right? For because you're leading troops, teams to get to a particular place. So you so you better be right in terms of what is important, right? What is it that you're trying to solve, right? Um, and then how to get there. I think you know. Uh, you, sh you should be open-minded that a leader is not expected to know every step how to get there. And that's why I frequently tell my team, right? So for example, we just acquired last year um, an AI education company, right? Um, of course, when we acquired it, it's not doing so well. The whole internet education online uh, industry is one in which is rapidly losing money. <laughs> now, what I can articulate is that, look, we, we bought this company. We have a view of wanting to transform how education is being done not just one-on-one -on -one online kind of you know, teaching you, but then with AI, how do you do adaptive learning and stuff like that, right? So I can describe where is it that we want to eventually end up with. But I tell them, look, you know, how you actually get to that particular mountain, right? In between there's rivers, there's rocks, there's lots of things that you, the, the job of our entire team is to figure out how to get there, right? And so, so we have, you know, with this team, um, you know, for the past year, I've been having weekly meetings with them. Every week we looked at, you know, what the numbers are. You know, we try different ways in order to get to different ways, right? Customer acquisition, we talked about how do you do better retention? How do you measure, you know, uh, people's you know, the ability to learn? How do you say that this is more effective than the others? You know, every week we're changing, right? Some of the months we do better, some of the months we do really badly. But, you know, we make it, it's, a, it's, a, it's redefining what a leader is supposed to do. Right, you know, we are here together to work out what's the right way to get to. And then you talk about, you know, I don't know, you know, I, I frequently in meetings because I have to host meetings typically 20, 30, sometimes, you know, lots of people where it comes from many different teams who are trying to solve problems together. And then sometimes, you know, in fact, just, just uh, two days ago, you know, I, you know, we were talking about, um, you know, one of the, uh, our AI teams and, you know, they have to solve complex algorithm on ranking, page ranking, we're, we're doing a search engine. And I, I, I really don't know. So I had that guy said, look, you know, I don't know. Can you explain to me step by step how you do it? I'm, you know, every step, how do you rank that? What's the rationale? And I asked this in front of 50 people, it doesn't, it, it, because it doesn't matter. Um, it's okay that a leader doesn't know specific things. You inculcate that kind of environment. Uh, you, you set the rules about what is the accepted norm. Uh, and then, you know, I think that will help change uh, and you release the, I think the burden of a leader must always be right. A leader, not only where the, where to go, but also every step of the way. I think that's just too much. Right. Thank you. Two quick yeah. comments uh, with what you made. Uh, first is to recognize that for leaders, uh, the age that to whom much is given, much is expected holds. So we have to hold ourselves to uh, uh, higher standards. Standard. The second one is that it really are two sides to this thing. And I love uh, this notion that Pio introduced, which is that we are, you know, leaders are human. Let's, re let's start there. And how do you make your, uh, uh, you know, the 50,000, 100,000 people? I mean, I mean, the, 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 the management team reporting to you is one thing, but uh, 50,000 in your spread all over China or or, or, or Asia, uh, uh, how do how are you you giving them a sense that you are you too are, uh, am human? Uh, that that takes some doing, uh, and 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 because when they see you as human, then all humans uh, know that we make mistake, and it's a good point uh, from from which to 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 be able to do that. Now I I wouldn't let this one go without mentioning the other side. Uh, the people to say sorry is one thing. What uh, what is uh, what about a, for, a society and the forgiving. audience who is uh, unforgiving? Yes, uh, you know, I, and I think uh, the unfortunate thing with social media these days uh, is that if you read it every day, you 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 will not get out of bed because you're so depressed and uh, yeah. how negative it is. Yeah, uh, but you 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 have to recognize uh, the fact that. You know, they, they, we should look at ourselves in the mirror and say, we are too, we too are human. Just because the other guy had much of responsibility does not give us the right to condemn the individual. Yes, we can point out, hey, this is not right, is, is it? Uh, that's, uh, that's, right. that's okay. So it really takes two to tango. And I think uh, uh, in the world, uh, thanks to the, the, the big tech companies and so on, there is uh, some going back a little bit to the older days where there's a give and take of uh, each other uh, as humans, which include allowing each other to make mistakes. 
I, I think it's a, it's a great point about being human. You know, leaders sometimes believe that they've got to project a superhuman quality. And I can tell you, and I'm sure we all agree, it is, you, you, can't, you can't live it up. I mean, you, you can't live that. I mean, how do you manage that kind of expectation if you create one? That I'm superhuman, I'm infallible. You know, so, so sometimes you are creating structures that you can't actually hold up, you know. So, so I, I thank you for your comments on this. I mean, this is a very important point. You know, it is about being human and, and really socializing everyone you are working with to accept the human and fallible side of you so that there is greater comfort in exposing one's vulnerability because there's confidence that the ground is willing to forgive and accept. That's what it is. That, that's, that's the kind of a social contract we are talking about, you know, that each one of you has articulated. If I could from here move on to a related point, you know, Singapore has always prided ourselves in being pragmatic, right? Pragmatic. And pragmatism, you know, suggests the ability to be flexible, to adapt to the times, to the needs of the day, you know, that's, that's pragmatism. But on the flip side, pragmatism also means that you don't have any permanent principles. You know, you can take pragmatism to the hill by saying, you know what, I don't have any, anything, I don't have a red line. Anything is fair game as long as it makes sense during the time. Now, how, and it goes back to something you said, Sun Yen, earlier on right? You said we must have common reference points. Some things are permanent, you know, whether it's religion or something. I mean, you need to be anchored. The person that you are, the values that you hold must be anchored on something that has some level of permanence. But if we take pragmatism to the hill, that means anything is fair game in Singapore. Is that, is that the kind of society that we want to be in? Or should there be certain things that cannot be compromised and are not for sale. And a, and a good leader sometimes is, is the person who traverses this too and says, these things are fine. This is where we draw the line. Do we have that kind of a line? Yeah, I, I, I for one, uh, would love Singaporeans to remain pragmatic because that is how we act out the living. Let's not forget, we don't have any uh, uh, hydrocarbon uh, we, we, you know, our water uh, out of uh, ingenuity and the, and the fantastic government, we are uh, almost self-sufficient in water. Okay, so let's, let's get, get that straight. So pragmatic, however, is not equal to expedient. Uh, you know, expedient means that you don't have principles and, uh, to, you know, you cheat and lie just to, just to uh, and kill and, 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 and uh, oppress uh, when it suits you. Now, that, that's not right. And so there is a red line between, you know, pragmatic, I would say thumbs up, please continue. Uh, and expedient, uh, not, not quite, not quite uh, my cup of tea. I'm not sure if we're referring to, it seems like you're asking a more political question uh, or in the business context, but nonetheless, I think the principles are the same. I think the outcomes, the final goal should not uh, shift. I mean, in the context of a country, should be the welfare of the country and stuff like that. Now, of course, it's being not just Jessica. Main, is, it, Jessica, it's yeah. not just country. Uh, uh, I go back to to what Piyush talked about. You know, Milton Friedman, his 1970, 1970 thesis. You know, where he talked about. You know, it, it's really all about fulfilling shareholder value. I mean, sure. that that's what so, it was. But is that what commercial for, companies are about? Yeah, but even for. You know, even for, for a company, any organization, right? As a leader, you talked about, you know, what, what kind of things should hold dear. The out, basically, the outcomes, right? If you want, however you define it, you know, you, you said that, you know, I want to maximize shareholder value. You know, I want to, you know, create whatever value in a particular industry, whatever. So, so that doesn't change, right? Um, being pragmatic doesn't mean that that keeps changing. But I think it's about being transparent. The, the, the difference I was trying to make between where you want to get to and how you're getting there. Right? Because it is, the leader has to make decisions, micro decisions every day about the path you're doing, the different kind of um, choices you are weighing against, you know, every step before you get to where you want to get to, be it at the, any organizational level. And that, that is the part that I think, you know, so the end goal shouldn't change, but the how you get there, the leader has to make decisions and you can be wrong. 
right, as a team or individually. And I think the key is not so much saying I'm sorry or not sorry. I think, that, you know, of course we should be, it's much more about being transparent about the choices that we're making and what I've assumed in order to get there. You know, and then, you know, yes, and often a good leader should actually be most times correct. <laughs> you know, that's a, that's a different uh, issue. But as long as you're transparent about it, um, about well, the, the what do you choice. mean by what do you mean by transparent? What so, for mean? example, um, uh, uh, you know, in some of our companies, we often have to balance between, uh, let's say, growth versus profitability versus I don't know customer value that we you know choose the kind of clients we choose. We're making decisions all the time uh, on that, right? Now, of course, I know I want where I want to be five years from now, ten years from now, but I gotta decide this year. Right. Do I sacrifice a particular thing? You know, sometimes I got to invest more because our product simply isn't there. And, you know, I'm not going to meet my profit targets, but I'm going to protect my customer, my growth, my my revenue. Right? I'm making a very specific uh, example. Now, I'll, I'll be transparent about it. Right. I'll, I will share my decision of why I think at this particular case, even though we can't have all at this point in time, I think we should do this in order to get there. Right. And so, we're so, gonna revisit so, it. so in other words, you're saying that. Um, if you feel that you're going to take a slightly different path, you you owe it to your people to explain to them and to persuade them and to win them over, not just to say, look, this is what I, I intend to do and just do it. But you know, you know that 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 additional step of persuading, going out of your way to persuade people so that they walk with you is how Absolutely. important is that? Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's being part of being transparent. Um, and it, it could change all the time. I mean, in new companies, we change strategy every three months, right? Uh, no, when we next release, I will explain, right? This path that we seem to be doing seems to work, but it's taking much slower than we expected, right? No, you know, let, how about if we do this instead? So I think it's about being transparent about the path that you're making. Again, you know, right. this micro path, you know, changes all the time, right? Okay. And I think really, it, it reduces the burden of every step I need to be right, because, you know, in the world, of, I, everyone say loss of information, loss of uncertainty, nobody can yeah. be certain that the, um, you know, that every step I'm taking is the right step. But as long as you correct quickly, you're transparent about the situation and the decisions you're making, I think most people will accept that. Okay, thank you. Well, Shwab, just yes. on the subject, I think um, see, the notion of principles and value is important, but uh, the complexity increases manifold uh, with the size of the population you're talking about. So if you talk about as an individual, I can make sure I have a very clear set of values and principles and I can hold myself accountable to it all the time. Uh, when I start thinking of a company, I have that as well. In fact, our whole edifice is founded uh, based on a very clear set of values. We spent a year trying to determine what should the soul of DBS be. And we determined some things that define DBS distinctively, some things we aspire to be, we put it together, you know, such a set of values. We actually evaluate people on that. You know, how well do you uh, embrace the values? How well do you subscribe to the values? But I have to tell you, when you move from one person to 25,000 people, it becomes a lot harder because then you get shades of difference. And so then you sort of say, okay, broadly speaking, this is a value system. When you get to a nation state, I think it gets extraordinarily hard. So you can espouse values like our pledge. Our pledge is a value statement. Yes. And says, this is what we want to do, regardless of race, religion, etc., etc., this is what we value. But within that pledge, it gives, it, it gives you tremendous room for differences. If you look at the uh, a, a Western liberal democracy, that is a value, that we value the right of the individual. Look at the U.S. and the entire state of constitutional amendment. The right of the individual is paramount. But within that, there are whole shades of gray on what exactly is the value system that is uh, overriding. So I think it gets quite complicated, particularly this execution, when you start scaling up to a nation state. So I, I don't disagree with you at all. You know, the complexity uh, is immense as you grow larger, right? And that's why you need leadership. It begs, I mean, that's the reason why you need strong leadership. People who are able to stand at the pulpit and win people over. And, and so leadership is, 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 is really about, you know, as Jessica talked about, you know, transparency. You know, you, you'd really need to take it as your duty to explain to people why certain decisions are being taken, precisely because you should assume that not everybody is completely aligned. And therefore you owe it to people, even, at, even in the end, if it means you agree to disagree. But people are interested to know from the leader why a certain decision has been made. And 
and that, that the person, the leader is taking pains to explain it. I mean, that's the point uh, that I think is being made. Sorry, you're going to say something. Today, I'm going to say, because I think that there are two different ideas. You take the U.S. today. You would argue that the U.S. stands for a value system. But at the same time, Trump versus Biden, they stand for two completely different value systems. So how do you reconcile the value system of the United States with the value system of the Republicans versus the value system of the Democrats? The, the supremacy of the individual versus the need for equity and equality, all of those are part of the same edifice. And therefore, whether Biden or Obama or Trump stand up and explain and are transparent, it's all very good. But you'll always find 53% of the people who say, I don't agree. Yeah. So the yeah. point is, it's, it's, it, it, we shouldn't be overly naive about how easy it is to do this at scale. Uh, I do think you should be honest in your own skin. You should feel comfortable that what you are standing for, what you're articulating and what you're espousing, you believe in, you can stand up and have the courage to stand for what you say, you can communicate it and you can inspire people to you know, follow, knowing everybody won't. I think those things are important. That's why I say authenticity is important. The and and, and I, I, I take your point and I think it's an excellent point you just, you just made, you know, uh, because actually that's the truth. When you see a leader, even if you don't agree with what he's doing or don't agree with what his, his values are in that particular, that particular point, but you still respect the person for saying, this is what I stand for. This is what I believe in. And, and uh, a case in point is, uh, is uh, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. You know, he has often said, you know, I know you disagree. I've got a duty as a leader. This is what I believe we should do. Um, this, these are the reasons why and let history judge me. You know, so there is a certain authenticity, a certain willingness to say, you know, to take the risk with people to say, this is who I am. Take it or leave it. This is who I am. I've got a job to do. I intend to do it and let history be the judge. And the number of times he said, let history be the judge is incredible. You know, so so I guess what we're driving at is if you if there is inconsistency in the values of a leader intrinsically, then that is difficult to accept. That's probably. But at a national level, at a larger level, we have to accept polarization. I guess that's what you're, you're saying. Well, Thank much. you. Thank you. Mr. Lim. Uh, you, you have to unmute. Mr. Lim, you have to unmute. Yeah. Yes. You know, yes. I just want to say, yes. Uh, you know, you mentioned about Lee Kuan Yew. You know, one, um, uh, if I can take uh, I mean, you, 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 served as his, you served as his principal private secretary yeah, for, three for, years. for three years. Yeah, if I can uh, take our discussion back a little bit to where we started here about yeah. pragmatism. I think Ms. Lee Kuan Yew had said that, uh, uh, you know, at the end of the day, no matter how brilliant the ideas may be, even from his ministers, they are useless if they cannot be executed. And I think we need to understand uh, when we talk about pragmatism in Singapore, it is with that regard. It is about the the capacity and the ability to translate the ideas into uh, uh, in a way that we can implement them properly, rather than you know just float around with ideas, but you can't uh, you can't activate them, you can't you can't get them uh, done. Um, but at the same time, I I would say that yeah, on a national basis, I I do accept that uh, since you're dealing, uh, let's say in the case of Singapore, even if you're dealing uh, just with the citizens, uh, there's such a variety of people that. Uh, uh, that is very difficult to say, you know, these are the values or these are the principles we stand for as a nation. And yet it is terribly critical because there must be some um, agreed principles upon which, uh, uh, upon which we, 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 we kind of uh, have that uh, consensus and that this is what makes Singapore and gives us the best chances of success. One of the things, for example, is I think um, uh, um, Singapore is a brand. We don't have natural resources. So how do we manage to Survive, how do you manage to succeed? You manage to succeed because you're a brand. The first brand, um, uh, the, and the, the, the first characteristic of the brand about Singapore that, that Mr. Lee Kuan Yew and then later leaders have, uh, have um, uh, brought about uh, is the brand of trustworthiness. People can trust you. This is why you cannot just sign an agreement and say, this is income, uh, inconvenient or uncomfortable. I'm going to just abandon the agreement. You can't do that. Um, because as a nation, we say you can, we will honor our word, we thought carefully about these things and this is what we committed ourselves to. So you can't simply say that this agreement is a little uncomfortable for us, let's throw it away uh, and start again. No, I mean, big powers may think that they can do it that way, 
but uh, but, but smaller powers can can expect to. But some some people argue uh, today right. that uh, the Lee Kuan Yew's mode of leadership is extinct, is 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 not relevant. What's your view on that? Um, no, I I would say yes. You, uh, you have to distinguish between the principles upon which you operate uh, and the and the house of doing it within a particular situation. Of course, how you do and how you can effectively do it is very dependent on the context. Uh, demographics change, people's education levels change, people's willingness to express themselves change. Uh, and, so, uh, and so, of course, you have to make adjustments in that regard. But principles, principles about, uh, as a nation, our brand fundamentally about trustworthiness, I, I would be very, very concerned if we abandon that. The second part about Singapore, I was just speaking to somebody this afternoon. It says, you know, you don't understand in Singapore the remarkableness of it. How it is uh, that in Singapore you can have a church next to a Buddhist temple, next to a Hindu temple, next to next to a mosque, and somehow you are able to work it out and that people are able to live with each other and accept these differences. I remember Lee Kuan Yew again. Uh, his principle simply is race and religion. We need to understand our visceral issues. People will kill each other for reason of race or religion. Somehow or other, we managed to build a legal framework and a social framework in Singapore, which allowed us to accept our diversity, to make space for each other so that we each can have the maximum freedom within the context of the freedom that I have must not impinge upon the freedom of my neighbor to similarly exercise his, his choices. Um, so how do how do you think how do you think uh, yeah. if I may just quickly yeah. ask you I mean, yeah. how do you think Mr Lee Kuan Yew managed to command that level of public trust? Fundamentally, because he delivered the goods. No, when you think about it, right? When Singapore became independent, people were very worried. I can remember my parents, right? Uh, first about jobs. Uh, how, how do you make sure that you have jobs? And particularly after the British says they go into withdrawal from Singapore and the British bases accounted for about 20% of GDP and 20% of employment. So how do you deliver jobs? So we decided on industrialization. We decided foreign investment is a terribly important way by which to move forward. Um, he delivered on housing. Um, uh, of course, you know, you, use, uh, you link the CPF and, and the HDB and, and he delivered on housing. He delivered on education, which gave the future to people. Uh, uh, to people at least through their through their children. Um, uh, so so fundamentally because you deliver when you deliver the goods, people develop their trust in you. And when the public, when the citizens have the trust in the leadership, um, you know leadership doesn't need to explain everything. Uh, at that point they sort of say, I believe you are concerned about my well-being and I believe you have the competence to work through this complex problem. So don't give me the problem. I elected you in so that you can take the problem and you deliver the goods. So fundamentally, at the end of the day, the leader is going to be judged by whether he delivered whatever people perceive as success. So that's the important thing. And I close off with this. It's yeah. terribly important, therefore, and this is a point that has been made previously uh, earlier on in our discussion. We need to know the people that we are serving. We need to know what their concerns are. And you have to deliver according to those concerns. And we have convinced them about sometimes having to sacrifice something in order to, in order to make the future for coming generations. Uh, it's not just a communication issue, but everything communication starts with a uh, an instinctive understanding as to what the worries, what the concerns, and what the hopes are for the people. And you have to address them, even if in some instances you can't deliver on their hope, you need at least to be able to explain why you can't deliver at this point in time, but you hope maybe their grandchildren will be able to have it. Right. And I guess that also assumes a certain level of interest in and curiosity for of, of what, what those interests are. Oh, you know, you, you, there must be a genuine interest in finding out what the concerns are on the ground, you know. Yes. Uh, Sunyan, uh, what's your take on this? First, I, I think that uh, uh, I like to sort of draw in this notion of data transparency that uh, Piyush uh, first talked about. Yeah. Um, I think, I wonder whether given our pragmatic uh, nature as a, as a nation, and, the, and, and, and I think we, this is a very different time because leadership uh, is context specific. We can't sort of look at Lee Kuan Yew and say, oh, that's extinct and uh, get me another one. That's, you know, that will, everything will be, will be fine. Because 
uh, how he would do in the, the, the present uh, very complicated uh, context, uh, you know, is something that, that, that is not a sure thing. Yes. Uh, so one of the pragmatic uh, uh, need of the nation right now is uh, we have a very complex problem. Uh, we have that uh, inclusiveness and fairness uh, sense uh, in values uh, by and large in, in, in people. I wonder whether, uh, you know, selective release in, of data on issues to sort of irrigate the, you know, say if given these facts, what would you have done? Uh, you know, would that help uh, preserve the, uh, the unity uh, with respect to the... Are, are you, I'm not very clear about the point you're making. Are you suggesting that there needs to be greater, uh, greater transparency in the, or greater democratization of access to information. That is correct. That's what okay. I'm saying. But it's not all or nothing, right? Yeah, of course, of it course. Is, and and like we have come a long way. I, I think we have come a long way in terms of, you, of making it a more flat uh, structure in terms of information dissemination. But I'm sure we have a long way to go in making okay. it. And by the but, way, but, yeah. by the way, since I since I worked on uh, the University's Institute of po Policy Studies, yeah, I can tell you. Uh, that uh, there's a lot of data that government does not have, they, uh, and and the pop, the private sector does not have that we should go out and gather, gather together, yeah, gather together. But but you know it, it's it's all still predicated on this notion of trust that that you know Piyush and everyone and Mr. Lim we talked about. You know it, it's such it can be an, an amorphous concept, but it's actually very solid. You know um, you can lose the trust that you've built over 20, 50 years overnight, you can lose it, you know, and, and, and then it goes back to how you view in the end, I think it goes back to how you view your leader. And it's not always rational, is it? You know, so, so at the end of the day, the, the leader must have certain qualities that endears himself to the people. And it's not about being populist, but it must endear himself to the people, you know, so that the people gives him the benefit of the doubt. When that happens, you know. So whether it's data, whether it's right, because if I don't trust my leader, I will always suspect that he's withholding information from me, even if he's not. If I don't trust my leader, I believe that he is having ERP gantry so that he can spy on me, even if he's not doing it. I mean, the entire system, especially what 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 Piyush said, you no, know, it's data everywhere. Data collection is everywhere, and can you imagine? Uh, you know, can you imagine a conspiracy theories? theory going, going ballistic, saying that every one of these things is because it's Orwellian, you know? So it, bo it does boil down to trust. Right? And you know, the, Shai, I'd say the, the trust comes from, I guess, two, three things. One, you got to be convinced your interests are aligned with mine. Yeah. When you start suspecting that you have a different agenda, or the other person has a different agenda, the leader is trying to line their own pockets, it's the current administration, you lose trust. Second, you've got to be honest with me that you're sharing the facts, understand the data, you're not taking me for a ride. Right? So uh, alignment of interest, um, honesty, and, and actually uh, sometimes brutal honesty. I think one of the reasons, despite whatever everybody say about Lee Kuan Yew, I didn't know him well, uh, he called a spade a spade. Uh, in today's world, there are two leaders who tie that, um, you know, Ray Dalio at Bridgewater, and Reed Hastings at Netflix are well known. Mm, mm, where they're mm. trying to drive cultures in their companies of brutal honesty, where everybody sits and you sit and critique each other and you're completely honest and transparent and everything works in that. And they both say that, you know, they're seeing extraordinary results. I'm trying to do something like that at DPS, create a culture of not being defensive and accepting feedback. Though it's not easy. It's not human nature to accept brutal honesty. But I think in some ways, my own assessment is that people began to trust uh, Lee Kuan Yew because finally, um, he was brutally honest on many things. Yeah, and, and if I can be brutally honest with you, I just want a quick quick comment from you. You've been very much in the news lately, Piyush, you know, uh, about, about, you know... The, I have no idea uh, what you're talking yeah. about. <laughs> I, I'm talking about the, 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 the allegation or the suggestion, you know, the fake news, the photograph, that went about, that went viral, talking about uh, DBS hiring a whole lot of uh, Indian workers, which is, which is, which is really, I mean, the, the, the picture itself was false, right? I mean, it was taken out of context. It was a photograph of you uh, taking, uh, being take, taken with the Indian staff in India, right? And then the suggestion was that this was in the Changi 
uh, business park. Business park. Uh, now tell me, as a leader, how did you respond to that? This was public. Know, well, that's true, but you don't have to respond to everything. And sometimes yeah. your actions speak louder than your words. This is one of the cases where I thought our actions were uh, are quite clear. I mean, you know, it's quite, you know, think about DBS today. My um, senior management team uh, is 100% Singaporean. My uh, technology leadership is 100% Singaporean. 90% uh, of my senior leader, everybody is Singaporean. So I don't need to go and make pronouncements because the actions speak more loudly than words can. So, you know, um, there'll be a lot of people with different views. You don't have to respond to everything. And, and if I may add, you know, I think because you have a strong, um, if I may say so, I think you have a strong level of trust in your organization for, for the leadership. Uh, your staff actually became the ambassadors. Your staff went out there and, and spoke up for the leadership of DBS, not just you, but the collective leadership of DBS. And that's actually a very good example of, you know, that level of trust. And after some time, you don't need to go out there and explain. People are willing to give you the benefit of doubt, you know, and that's actually very, very important. Uh, people would have expected you to come out and explain yourself. You didn't, and there was no real expectation. And do you realize in the end, after some time, it just went away. It's not one of those things that persisted. You know, so I, I brought it up not to be mischievous, but I brought it up because I thought it is very relevant to what we're talking about today. So, Vishwa, my view on this, yeah. you know, this goes back to context and having an empathy or a nose for what the context is. You can't be naive. And this is true not just in Singapore, this is true globally. There is a sense of insecurity among people. Uh, the, the economics are not good. People are worried about jobs. So that kind of environment has to breed a degree of circling the wagons. You're seeing it in country after country. Yeah. So it's not surprising that you see that in Singapore. You can't let yourself overreact to that because this is just the reality of the situations and the reality of how humans will, will behave and react. So you've got to accept that you know this is the way life is. Uh, as long as you are again honest to yourself, you know you're doing the right thing. You don't need to worry about uh, these things too much. Yeah. Um, so I, I, yes, I, I, yes, I, Mr. I can take a little bit of uh, what uh, what Pius mentioned just now. He mentioned Ray Dalio of Bridgewater. It's yes. true, it's about brutal honesty or what they call radical transparency. Uh, that, that they just tell, tell tell people off immediately, you know, and they give immediate feedback as to where somebody has done wrong and so forth. And I want to tell you this, uh, just this story, you know, I was speaking to one of the senior executives and say, how is it that you are able to, to live in this kind of environment, you know, where you get this criticism and this feedback um, uh, immediately? And he told me this, he said that, uh, you know, he... He trained as a, a, a one of a, um, uh, he was previously in the army, you know, a kind of a commando unit. And he says, you know, commandos, when we train, we go out on a mission in the team. Uh, and, you know, during our training, uh, if somebody did the wrong thing, everybody in the team would swear at him. He said, we swear at each other, not because we hate each other. We swear at each other because our lives depend on each other and we can't afford to have people making mistakes. This is why he says when he trains with the commando team, he says people need to give immediate feedback. You make a mistake, everybody needs to shout out that you made a mistake because we just want to make sure uh, that you don't, you don't do a similar kind of mistake in the operation. And he said that because he came with that kind of background, he understood completely about this radical transparency because the point I want to make is it's not about the radical transparency or brutal honesty. It is about we care for each other. And this is the way by which we show that we really, we really want to help each other be the best that we can be. So, so everything goes back again to the trust factor and yes. everything goes back again towards this, this empathy, this feeling that people have for, for each other. And that's what we require also as, as leaders yeah. among people. It, it, it's, and it goes yeah. back to that, that point about, you know, that, that Piyush made about the importance of humanities. That, there's a question from one of our uh, audience, uh, Pavita Kaur Gill, and this is a question, if I may read it to, to you. Can the humanities better enable us to know how to live with the unknown unknowns and uncertainty in life because the focus isn't on the predictable and objective, but involves the ability to interpret the world beyond a data-driven the statistical or empirical basis. Um, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll put it to Piyush first, since you brought up this whole point, you know, about don't just focus on STEM. Don't forget well, I, the humanities. Yeah, so I, I think, you know, the short answer is yes. And I've said that already, because I think uh, 
we tend to be very technocratic. You need skills. Yeah, you need to be good at tech. You need the the, the science uh, skills. I think those are, are important. Uh, but at the same time, I think you need a lot of the soft skills. You need to be able to understand the big question that talked about. What makes humans tick? Uh, you know, what is uh, uh, um, you know driving people? And that's particularly true in this day. There's, you know, uh, Sunyan talked about it. I mean, uncertainty is uh, not only there's going to continue, then nobody knows what's coming down the pike. Uh, you have to continue to be nimble and agile and all the fashionable world. You've got to continue to adapt. And in all of that, you're going to have to chart a course saying, what is the right thing to do? Uh, that what is the right thing to do is a left brain activity, not a right brain. Activity. And so you've got to encourage the development of the left brain as well. Yeah. So, Sunyan, you were going to say something? Yeah, I, I just wanted to uh, illustrate it with one very specific uh, humanity. Uh, one of the book uh, that I, uh, I have a collection called 30 uh, Lifetime Core Reading Books that I enjoy and read again and again. And, and, and most of them had nothing to do with business or economics, uh, I'm afraid. But this book is called Eight Little Piggies. Uh, you may have heard of it uh, by uh, Stephen J. Gould, a natural historian. Uh, it's 30 over chapters, each one of them independent essays uh, about, about events in the natural history. And uh, it is amazing uh, with respect to something that is esoteric as looking at uh, the evolution, survival, and non-survival of species that uh, it informs so much of, of humanity. Uh, he wrote it with a, with a style that is not very, very uh, obtuse, easy to read. But the important thing he's making every chapter is that, you know, we are not uh, understanding, we don't know as much as we, we, we need to know or could know, not because the, the you know, it is, uh, for example, paleontology or talking about dinosaurs, uh, you know, millions of years ago, uh, in Miocene and, 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 uh, and so on. But it is our own construct in our brain that limits and close off our minds to a possibility and denying uh, the, uh, the existence of, of, uh, of facts. Fascinating, fascinating uh, uh, humanity. And it's reading those uh, rather than uh, calculus or physics that I studied in uh, engineering uh, that uh, re-educate me or bring me up to, the, uh, to, to speed, that humanity is really inform uh, how uh, human beings interact with uh, society and interact with uh, our universe, which we have to co coexist with, never mind that we are supposed to be the supreme race. Yeah. And um, one of the things that you spoke about uh, in... Uh, in one of the earlier sessions, um, Sunyan is, you know, the ability to empathize and the ability of society or companies or organizations to actually genuinely accept failure. You know, I mean, we seem, you seem to suggest that we don't seem to have a culture, although we talk about it, we don't really seem to have a culture where there is an attitude of, of, of accepting, uh, failing and trying, you know, uh, I mean, for example, the, the, the Wright brothers, we wouldn't have aeroplanes if, if there was no acceptance of failure and trying again and trying again. You know, today you fail once and you said, don't bother. Uh, there, there, there are no returns on investment. Don't try it again. You know, you know, you know that the attitude of giving people a second chance, third chance to try it again. You know, then you, you may hit it the 15th time, but you hit it big. I feel, I mean, that there's a sense also in Singapore that we tend to, we tend to give up very fast because it's, it's all mathematical. You know, we want a hit rate that's very, very high. If, if there are too many failures along the way, then there's something wrong with, uh, with the hit rate. Uh, do you think that we need to deliberately uh, inculcate this, this attitude of accepting failure and being a lot more tolerant about inefficiencies? Well, I'd say the answer, my, my the answer is definitely yes. So I think we are, we are tend to be risk averse um, as a people and a country. And by the way, that's for some one good reason. Uh, we've built a, loss, a lot, so we have a lot to lose. There's a lot at stake. But uh, having a lot at stake makes us uh, sometimes risk averse. But some of it, I think, is also cultural. Uh, in the US, bankruptcy is a sign of honor, badge of honor. 
So if you want to go and raise funding for your next uh, 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 company, if you've had three failed startups, that seemed to be a good thing. In Singapore, uh, bankruptcy is a sign of failure. So in fact, at time once you're bankrupt, you don't even get to open a bank account a second time, right? So how do you create this culture where it's okay to make mistake? It's okay to uh, take risk. Uh, it's not easy. So I'll tell you what we did in DBS. Because I figured that this your idea of how do you encourage people to experiment and take risk in an environment which is not that forgiving is quite important. We actually went out of our way to create a set of awards for daring to try, uh, dare to fail. Uh, we only gave these awards to people who tried and failed. We didn't give them to people who succeeded. And it was just to sort of signal to people it's okay to try and fail. We made heroes of people who tried. Now, these, are, these are sort of gimmicky. Uh, and we recognize it, but sometimes you got to come up with yeah. packaging and gimmicky stuff to capture people's minds and imagination. So I do think we need to do more of that. Yeah, Jessica. Um, I have I have two thoughts um, on that. I think um, um, when I talk to many Singapore organizations, um, we forget about one of the some of the underlying passion and things that drive us, uh, and I think that helps to think more about problems and failures, my point about opportunity. And I'll give an example later. Uh, and then therefore we don't become, and then the second point is then we, we be, we're not so risk-taking. I'm quite an unusual person. Um, you know, for me, I went to MIT with you know, doing engineering. My dad has taught me to do engineering. For me, uh, in my last year to, to go into McKinsey, do consulting, of course I did economics as well. Um, it was completely different. Nothing has turned out whatever I thought to be. Um, but I think the, you know, I, I'm I'm sparked by the reaction I think um, during this COVID, right? Um, you know, in in China, you know, where I just came back from Wuhan uh, two weeks ago, sorry, where we have teams there. Um, you know, when everyone is concerned about your own safety, we have a we have a health center testing center there. Uh, and when I met the health center head, you know, he organized. Um, for our you know, nurses and, and doctors, a hundred of them, they're basically volunteers, but everyone was, they closed Wuhan. These people who were outside for New Year, actually, you know, they, 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 they came back, right? And the, the trains were stopped. They had to get, get on trucks. They had to really make an effort to get into the city that basically everyone was shutting out of. Uh, and they have families. Uh, and they went to where they thought were folks that were not covered. The, the jails, the old folks home where nobody could care, the nursing staff, you know, has had left and the old folks who are the most vulnerable. And they went around, we have a CT big car, you know, doing swab big tests and et cetera, right? And this was right at the, the, the peak. Um, that's the story, you know, really touched me. Um, I think we talked about leaders in a very high scented way, et cetera. I think leadership risk-taking and this passion, passion and risk-taking is something that can, you know, in every, every, every person. But you first have to start with a purpose, a sense of purpose and passion, right? When we talked about, you know, when you know, I run many of a healthcare business, you know, the, you know, the thought of basically wanting to provide better healthcare, right? It simply doesn't, you know, it's in, yeah. we cannot accept three hours going to a hospital, lining up for a cold, you know, bring your kids there, you know, and, and that drives you people to do amazing things amazing that you will things. not have thought about. Right. And I think that we, you know, Singapore being a very comfortable uh, and mature place, sometimes, you know, some of us may have forgotten about uh, that. So it's, it becomes less obvious in an environment why, you know, and therefore you become more focused on all the downsides and stuff. Um, so I think, you know, just if you want to have risk taking, you have to first passion and sense of purpose. That's lots of things to be fixed on. I mean, you know, instead of saying, well, I'm sorry or not sorry. I mean, we still have Singaporeans actually, you know, actually living in poverty line, uh, you know, as we define it. I was shocked. My daughter did an essay and I said, oh, I, I didn't even know that, right? Um, so I think we should focus back much more on the core issues at hand. Yeah. I think that will unleash the passion and therefore the drive and the risk that they want to do. People have to get excited around something. You can't just, you can't just say, oh, you, you take more risk, take more risk. Something has to be driving them, particularly for the young people. Um, that's a, it's a great point. Thank you. Uh, if you can say something. Uh, yes. So yes, I, yes like Mr. That. I mean, this is looking, uh, trying to imagine it looking from a governmental point of view, you know, about the future of Singapore. Uh, I'm really quite concerned about this point. You know, we, uh, I think there have been statements which says that we need to be 
uh, we need to be innovative. You know, innovation is terribly important for Singapore. I'm not terribly sure at the moment that we have seen innovation and enterprise as absolutely critical, which will determine life and death in terms of success for our future. You know, I just asked a simple question. When you say you want to be innovative, so what percentage of your efforts do you think and do you, and, and do you expect to be successful in? If you say you expect to be successful 100%, you can't be very innovative if you are going yes. to be successful 100%. So just talking generally, even to young people, and say, what about 50%? They say 50% is not innovative enough. In fact, we settled more or less in many of my conversations, somewhere between 10% and 20% um, hit rate, uh, uh, hit rate uh, is about the right definition of an innovative, a really innovative society. Think about that. We are really saying success comes only one out of 10 or one out of five, and Therefore, we need to build up our young people. We need to build up the school system. We need to build up our workers to accept a situation where yeah. when you try a new thing, only one out of 10 or one out of five times you succeed. So yeah. move away from this blame culture and all that to say, how are you going to get there? I yes. will tell you this story. I had a friend in Israel um, many, many years ago and he's retired 20 years. And last time I saw him, I asked him, so what are you doing these days? He says, He's going around schools in Israel setting up robotics clubs. I said, well, what's so special about robotics club? 250 schools in Singapore robotics club. So I asked him in curiosity, so what do you do in robotics clubs? It's interesting. He said, the first thing we do in our robotics clubs is we teach the students social responsibility. They need to be able to address the question, what is the usefulness? What is the benefit to society? And the minimum at least is what you're trying to do is not irresponsible with respect to society. Then I say, after that, what do you do? He says, after that, we teach them how to cope with failure. Yeah. Remarkable. In other words, coping with failure is not just something you're born with. It is something you deliberately work on. It is something you can bring about. But you are going to do this in a radical kind of way, possibly even through the school system. You're going to be prepared to do it only if you accept right at the beginning the criticality, absolute life and death for Singapore as to whether you become an innovative or not such an innovative place. Thank you. Uh, the time check now, it's, it's we've got 15 minutes more. Um, I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to share one more question from the audience. If you could just have from, from, from you a one minute response, because after that, I want to start wrapping up and I'll ask each of you to do a wrap up based on a question that I'm going to ask you. So here's a question that I've, I've selected from the audience. Um, just wondering, uh, uh, sorry, not that. Okay, here is a question from Sun Hock Lim. I feel that one constant remains for leadership pre and post COVID, the ability to recognize and accept change and have the guts to change. How do we ensure that more leaders embrace this to purposefully rethink, reconfigure and reallocate to rebuild, reshape and reinvent? That's a lot of re's. Uh, not just the better and purposeful management of nations, but of businesses, social enterprise. So basically, how do we ensure that more leaders embrace this to purposefully rethink, embrace the, the guts to change? Uh, so I'd like a one minute response, if you do have a response, you know, from each one of you, from your own experience, right? The question is, uh, the, the <coughs> post COVID, the ability to recognize and accept change and have the guts to change the way he, do we have it? The leaders in Singapore. So, Vishwab, I think this is really the same conversation we were having. I think the guts to change comes from the willingness to accept failure. Yes. And willingness to accept uh, risk. And, you know, a lot of people talk about the culture change in DBS over the decade. If I had to define one of the key things we've been able to achieve, uh, it is really this. Uh, and the insight is that, you know, you've got to give people the capacity to experiment. You've got to be willing to uh, let people fail. You've got to be able to recognize uh, risk-taking and say it's okay to make. And it's not easy in our industry. We're a regulated industry. That's you right. have military responsibility. You can get beaten on the head every time. But it is my job to give people shelter and air cover, saying you go ahead and you try. And, you know, I'm there. I will back you and I will protect you. So when you give, you know, what are people worried about in our company? They're worried about the job. They're worried about not getting paid. They're worried about getting scolded. Yeah. So how do you take those worries out of the system? So that then gives them the degrees of freedom to say, I can try. I know that the senior leadership has my back. 
Yep. And, and you, you've got to be exemplary at the very top. Yeah. And, and you've got to show it to them and provide the comfort. Uh, Sunyan, a quick response. I think guts is uh, not easy to have. Uh, it is uh, one of the uh, perennial problems at an individual person and leader level uh, in the leaders I work with. The good news is that Singaporean is not, uh, this is not a unique Singaporean disease. Yeah. Uh, I think it's everywhere. It, it, it's all relative. Uh, the important thing is, as uh, Piyush have said, is that the, the, the local, local context, whether it is a DBS bank or a particular startup company, how do you set up the, the, the culture so that people dare to fail? And, uh, you know, failure is the best teacher. Uh, you, you're not going to find out what you're made of. And never mind what your father, mother, my teacher might tell you until right. you start to fail. Then you yeah. know what you got. Then you know wh what you need to. Uh, and above all, there is a, something else that we haven't talked about, which is your cognitive. is an English word. They say, where are you headed? There's something there's a driving force that is undeniable in terms of where we're headed in, in our life. And, and when you fail, you, you pull yourself together and you get up and what direction to go, to try again. And that is the force of the co-native. And, 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 and that's what the leader provides. That's right. Yeah. Now, Jessica, you, uh, very quickly, what's your, what are your thoughts? I mean, you, 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 you shared, uh, I mean, it's interesting. When you left McKinsey, you said you were given a gift uh, which was a sword and a teddy bear. The sword to be tough and cut people down and the teddy bear to allow people to hug. So how do you manage this sword and teddy bear thing and, and give people the comfort to make mistakes? She's used the sword with me. I don't know who she's used <laughs> the teddy bear with. <laughs> for herself, for herself, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I, oh, well, on the, I'm, I'm surprised you know of that uh, story. Um, so I, it was given to me um, when I made partner. Uh, at McKinsey and my teams gave it to me um, to illustrate how I've man I have two parts of my brain that I one that I use to solve the problems where I'm extremely tough and I pursue perfection uh, and then the other part is really for my you know for people I, I do genuinely care and like people I give them advice um, for them professionally and sometimes when they're not suitable I that's why you know even when I let go of people I can have very genuine conversation because you know I, I genuinely tell them why it's not suitable uh, it will actually hurt them more. So that's that's the context uh, for that. But I'm, I'm surprised yeah. you heard. It. But I, on, <laughs> on this particular point, I think- A quick one, quick, quick response, yeah. Risk and failure. I, I do think that most importantly, from my own personal experience, is setting high enough goals for yourself. Really, really high aspiration goals. Sometimes I think, you know, that will force you that you have to change and think innovatively in order to get there. Right? It, it, nobody would expect, even, even myself, when I join, we only have 50 million app users. Today, we have 576 million app users in eight years, right? You give that goal to any company, you know, even to myself when I first joined, I would have said it's not possible, right? But if you set an aspirational enough goal, we have set up companies, we failed. I have closed three companies before, but of course I have 11 that's successful, you know, but it will force you to come up with different ways and you know, get there. So I think the first step to even before everything that Piyush and Sun Yen said is that you have to have significant enough aspiration um, to drive yourself there. Right. Okay. So uh, we, we are going to come, we, we are now to the end of this session. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to take reference from a question here that uh, this person called RJ asked, and, and then I'm going to add to that. And then I'd like each one of you to take two minutes to comment specifically in response to this question. The question is, we have talked about trust and authentic leadership but it's coming from this person called RJ. But if I may ask, how will, it, how will we be able to implement it in the whole of nation or is it ever implementable? So my, my additional question to you, I think it's very clear to everyone here in this discussion that leadership is of prime importance, especially in a post COVID uh, environment. There, there is, there's been a crisis of leadership all across. We badly, need strong leadership, okay? I think that's accepted. Now, what, and so, so what is the reason why we are not able to get leadership qualities surface? What's holding it back in our society, in our companies, 
I'm talking about the Singapore context. We all know we do need good leadership, but why does there seem to be a dearth of strong leadership in whether it's a government sector or commercial sector or people sector? If each one of you can highlight one fundamental thing that needs to change, that's actionable, that would be very useful. I think I'm going to go back to the data. I, I think uh, transparency and honesty is important. Um, and I think one of the things that we can do better, whether at a corporate level or national level, uh, is to shed greater light through uh, data. Uh, that uh, allows people to uh, see the authenticity and the, the, the reality of what it is that you're doing and what it is that you say you're doing. I think that could be helpful. And, and that uh, builds, helps to build and sustain trust. Yep. Right? That's, yep. What, what's, that's what you're driving at. Thank yep. you. Uh, Mr. Lim? I would say for a long time, uh, uh, even time of Lee Kuan Yew, right, he was talking about uh, the, the, the People's Action Party doesn't believe in the politics of expedience. Instead, they believe in the politics of explanation. But in many ways, the politics of explanation works only within the context of full trust by the people then all you need to do is to tell the people, nah, this is what I'm going to do, this is why I'm going to do it, and then leave it like that. But I think when, when, when the trust paradigm begins to weaken, and, and, you, can't, uh, and you can understand for the people, right, uh, that, um, uh, that at the time of independence, when Lee Kuan Yew was in charge, uh, as I said, he delivered the goods, people had intrinsic trust in him. Now, therefore, for succeeding generations, I think Overall, the politics, domestic politics, has to move from a politics of explanation to a politics of conviction. But more than that, I think with, uh, with newer people coming through, with people getting more educated, more willing to express themselves, even a politics of conviction is not enough. I think, I think it is a politics of involvement. And to me, I, I, I see that, that, that that's, a, that's a change that has to take place from expedience to explanation, to conviction, to involvement. Um, and, and, and for each of these steps, you are really saying to me, uh, this is a response to demographic changes. Uh, so you cannot presume upon the trust of the past. Uh, uh, in order the trust the parents may have, you cannot presume that the children have the same trust in you. So this, the trust has to be renewed with every generation. And that trust has two dimensions when you talk about government, right? Uh, first, a tr a people trust that you care about their well-being. And second, people trust that you have the competence to solve the problems. So it's both care and competence that you have to, you have to address. Yeah. So an and, and added question, Mr. Lim, uh, what, what you said makes a lot of sense. Uh, if I may ask a more specific question, mm. what do you think um, we can do differently from what we're doing today to achieve that? No, I would say, for example, you know, I, I, I think about the white, uh, the, 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 the white paper on population, right? Uh, the only thing I really remember about that paper is 6.9 million, quite frankly. If you ask me all the details of it, I mean, all that has passed. I, I can't quote you the details, but I know 6.9 million is a totally, in, totally offensive um, figure. Um, now, the fact that people just a few weeks before that was complaining about crowded MRT, uh, uh, crowded MRT trains and so forth, was not addressed. On the other hand, the fact of the matter is this, you need a figure to plan the future, to plan, uh, you know, whether you plan transportation or hospitals or, or road systems and so forth, you need a figure to plan. And the, and, uh, and, uh, and the important thing to recognize is that if I, if I give a figure of 6.9 million and the actual population turns out 6.5, that's nice, we enjoy we enjoy better the facility which I'm planned for 6.9. On the other hand, if you have a figure of 6.9 and you turn out to a 7.5, you're in real trouble because you're now saying you want 7.5 million people to fit into what you planned for 6.9. So in fact, the people were offended by the fact that 6.9 is such a big figure compared to a population of 5.5. When in fact, if the figure, if a figure is, uh, uh, if you end up with a high figure, in fact, it plays better for our lives then you end up with a low, and then you end up with a low planning figure. But I don't see that this was explained. So this is the kind of thing that we can do better 
um, I think, oh, of course, that event was many years ago. Many years ago, yeah. yeah but certainly, you can do better in terms of recognizing what people's concerns and worries are and make a point of addressing those yeah. worries. And, and, and I guess you're talking about having a better sense of the pulse yes. on the ground, right. you know, and, and to respond to that pulse. Thank you. Um, Jessica? Um, I have two suggestions. I think um, one is, um, you know, for the individual themselves, anybody, doesn't matter where you are, which, uh, uh, which role you play, you know, whenever the, you talk of complain about leaders, you, sh you know, you sh everyone's a leader. You got to step up and solve the problems yourself, right? So I, I don't like people complaining about stuff. You're part of the team, solve it. Um, so I think this is a mindset change for everyone, right? We sh it's very easy to complain about. Everybody has a leader somewhere, right? Uh, it's very easy to blame problems on just leaders. So I think um, this, is, this is a mindset that individuals, I think, should encounter and should start at young. Um, you know, that's why, you know, I teach my daughters as well. The second one is that of the system. I think if you want a, an entity or organization or a country um, whereby you want to have a strong leadership and innovation or whatever, then you have to be able to tolerate a bit of chaos. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Ping'an is a highly competitive environment. Anyone can criticize anyone. People are held to accountability, right? It's very clear if you fail, um, you know, and you have to tolerate that because you have to create a system whereby it's okay for others to voice their opinions um, or, or different ways or, or you know, or diff like why this is, this is not good or not good. Now, it doesn't matter whether, it cannot be all right because not everyone is the same. What is right, you know, it's good, bad, you know, so you have to be able to tolerate that, but you have to create that system because otherwise even good individuals, they don't want to speak up after a while because they can speak, they will be, you know, in an organization, they won't be taken seriously, right? And, the, and whoever the leader is still there, right? It doesn't get changed. And then you get a very passive type of uh, company, right? So, so that's why in my experience, you want growing, innovative, fast company, you gotta have that, that kind of right. system. That kind of tolerate. system and culture. Yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, Sun Yen, you, we, we, have, we just have one minute. Okay, right. yeah. uh, let me share one uh, at a societal level for a change and yeah. one at yeah. an individual level. Uh, at a societal level, I wanna talk about the critical role of institutions. If we don't have critical institution, the society does not trust, there's no trust. So look at the uh, FAA. Uh, if the international uh, uh, community do not, no longer trust the FAA to say that 737 MAX is uh, safe to fly, and it takes the Chinese government to jump in and say, we're grounding all our, yeah. our airplanes, uh, we have a huge international trust problem. Uh, if the CDC is no longer trusted by Americans as to whether, you know, what is the, 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 the to do with the disease, uh, where do you turn to? You look at a mess. So there's no societal trust. So in the role of institution is integrity and so on is supremely uh, important and it takes good government uh, to maintain that. Now at the personal level, I do a lot of work on trust. Uh, and one of the most critical things that is uh, undersung is the fact that you don't need to agree with each other. You just need to know where each other is coming from. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and to do that, it means that you have to be uh, based on the fundamental of truth seeking. Are we seeking the truth or are we just kind of trying to get, uh, get my way regardless of the truth? Secondly, is to be transparent. I uh, have the courage to be transparent and say, okay, I sorry, you may be the big boss, I disagree. And here's why I disagree with you. And be respect and maintain that mutual respect. It goes a long way uh, to, to, to build and, to, and maintain trust interpersonally. Thank you. So my, my take, very short, quick take on this is, one thing that jumps at all of us is, is we need to be, leaders have to be a lot more purpose-driven and that purpose has to be values-driven, you know, and then people will have something to, to aspire to. And the role of leaders is to provide opportunities, as many opportunities and create a culture where people actually are excited about doing things and not troubled or bothered about trying and failing. In fact, the people leaders will, will have to reward people who try and fail and punish people who don't try and succeed. You know, so I think, I think that's the kind of culture shift that I'm hearing from all of you. 
the new world the new world is defined by unpredictability and uncertainty and we need people who are a lot more comfortable with gaps in logic you know but when there's a gap in logic what i'm hearing from all of you is there must be a, a moral compass a reference point that gives you that instinctive and intuitive sense of direction you know and and i i i i I would like to end by by highlighting a, my, my favorite quotation by uh, Albert Einstein you know great spirits have always encountered violent opposition from mediocre minds the question is whether we want to be a great spirit or a mediocre mind and that will determine the direction that our country and the companies that we're talking about will take thank you very much lady and gentlemen for joining us today thank you thank you, you. all right thank you thank you bye, -bye.